Um, thanks, everyone, for coming today. Uh, my name is Jennifer Jett. I'm a vice president here at the FCC. Um, before we start, uh, just a couple of quick things. Please do turn off your phones or silence them. Um, and also wanted to let you know about a couple of upcoming events uh, at the club. Um, stick around tonight, first of all, because we have our Monday film screening. Uh, the film tonight is called One Small Visit. It's a 30-minute uh, film about an Indian immigrant family that unexpectedly passes through Neil Armstrong's home hometown in Ohio and ends up on his doorstep. Um, so there is still time to sign up for that. And this uh, Thursday, I believe, uh, the 29th, uh, we have our regular quiz night. So if you haven't signed up for that and you would like to, um, please check that out. Um, but for today, uh, we're very pleased to welcome our guest, William Kirby, um, who is the T.M. Chang Professor of China Studies at Harvard and Spangler Family Professor of Business Administration at Harvard Business School. Uh, he is a university distinguished service professor at Harvard, where he is chairman of the Harvard China Fund and faculty chair of the Harvard Center Shanghai. He, uh, at Harvard, he has also served as director of the Fairbank Center for Chinese Studies, chairman of the history department, and dean of the faculty of arts and sciences. Uh, he's written a number of books about China, and including the one that we're talking about today called Empires of Ideas, about the university systems in Germany, the US, and China, and uh, prospects for the future. Um, so, yes, he is going to uh, give a presentation first, um, and then I will ask a couple of questions, and then we'll open it up to the floor, so please get your questions ready, and I think we'll have a really good discussion. Um, so, yes, thank you so much for coming. Let's, let's give thank it a Thank you, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, pleasure. It's a real pleasure to be here, and uh, just in case you don't know, those of us outside of Hong Kong and outside of the world of greater China truly admire the work that journalists do in this environment, which, as I've discovered, is not without its challenges, um, but truly, truly extraordinary. To, and great to be here in this historic building and in this historic club. What I'm going to talk about is basically, when you think about it, what makes a country in great, uh, enduringly great? Is it the size of an army, size of an economy? These do matter, of course. Uh, but what makes it an international leader uh, over time? And at least in my view, the, great, the, the leaders, the pace setters, as it were, uh, of, of modern civil, or civilization from the 18th century on have also all been leaders also in the realm of culture and education. Think of the Da Qing Guo and the 18th century in the Qianlong period, uh, think of France uh, and Germany, or think of France in the 18th century, Germany and, and Britain in the 19th century, and to some degree, and some very considerable degree, uh, the United States in the 20th century. And if you think that ideas matter, then the institutions that produce ideas matter very critically. And those are things we call largely universities. You know, universities are not quite uralt, but they are uh, more than a millennium old. Uh, this one, only 100 years old here in Shangang Uh But the, the modern university, and think of this this way, the modern research university is not very old. It's exactly 233 years old this year. And it was founded in 1810 in Berlin uh, after the Prussian obliteration by Napoleon, uh, and King Frederick William III said something that I've never seen a political leader say since then. He said, we will replace with intellectual strength what we have lost in physical strength and in territory. Uh, and he deputed this gentleman, Wilhelm von Humboldt, to build an altogether new institution and to create the institution that we, the kind of institutions that you will have all gone through, or most of you will have gone through, uh, uh, that is devoted not simply to the passing on of knowledge from one generation to the other, but the creation of knowledge. The idea of a research university is a fundamentally new idea in 1810, one devoted to Wissenschaft 
science in every one of its dimensions. It should be a research university in which faculty and students work together, the unity of teaching and learning. It should be a research university in an institution that even if entirely funded by the state, uh, has institutional autonomy. Uh, and it should be an institution that has Lehrfreiheit, the freedom to teach on the part of faculty, and the Lernfreiheit, the freedom to learn. And the center of it should be not a business school or a professional school. German universities were largely pre-professional education before. This. It should be the philosophical faculty, what we would call in the United States the faculty of arts and sciences. This becomes the model of the modern university, first in Germany, and it becomes an extraordinary international model. Uh, this is the great library across the street uh, from the university, right next to the royal palace, the former royal palace, now rebuilt uh, in, in Berlin. And this influence defines the modern university everywhere in the world. So somebody here must have, anyone here uh, graduate from Stanford? So what's the, what's the motto of Stanford? That's excellent. Are you happy to be German? No, uh, that's not fair. But that's, that's excellent. Thank you so much because that is, you know, nobody at Stanford can pronounce this today. But uh, the idea of the wind of freedom blows is Stanford's motto. But as we know, if we fast forward through the German story here, the wind of freedom ceases to blow. Uh, it blows only partially in Germany. This is Max Weber, who was a high, strong critic of the limits of academic freedom uh, during the Wilhelmine period. Uh, and then, of course, it ceased to blow altogether with the Nazi seizure of power in 1933, and then the physical destruction of the university uh, during the Second World War and its Sovietization after the Second World War. Uh, and then an alternative German university grows up, the Freie Universität Berlin, uh, where I was once a student. Here is John Kennedy giving one of the most remarkable speeches. You can find it on the uh, Kennedy Library website, one of the most remarkable speeches by any political leader at an institution of higher education about what it means to be a free university. This just months before he was murdered. Uh, it became a very free university from the point of view of its administrators. Uh, I was a student there in the 70s and uh, extraordinarily vibrant place. I had a seminar on Marx that I took and there were 15 students in the seminar and six different communist parties uh, trying to figure out what the Marx actually wanted. But the long and the story here is this university here, the University of Bergen, today called the Humboldt University, times change. I got onto this topic in 2010, just beginning to think about it, on the 200th anniversary of the university, a huge conference on the original model. And the president of the university welcomed us by saying, and I quote, nobody would take my university as a model for anything today. He was very quickly no longer the president of the Humboldt University, but he was not wrong. The greatest university in the world for over 100 years uh, is no longer the best in the world, no longer the best in Germany, not even the best in Berlin. Times change. And the Americans pick up the slack. Uh, this is another statue by somebody who is not such an intellectual, but he was a donor uh, named Harvard uh, to my university that plagiarizes different architectural forms uh, as it uh, seeks to imagine itself at different periods uh, of its time. But it becomes a serious research university. You know, Harvard University, very old university, founded in the late Ming Dynasty. Um, uh, this gentleman, Elliot, only not until it's past its 200th birthday did it become a serious research university worthy of the name. Um, and uh, uh, this gentleman made it a serious, serious re research university before, during, and after the Second World War, which is a major galvanizer for American uh, research universities. If you look at this, you know, Harvard, maybe because of its age and size at the time, you know, this is the earliest ranking of any university that I could find. Uh, it's ranked number one in terms of men of science. How many people actually do serious work, research on your faculty? And Harvard being bigger than these is better. But the best university pound for pound in the United States in 1910 is Clark University in Worcester, Massachusetts. The Caltech of its day. But again, nothing goes up forever if you don't continue to reinvent 
yourself. Um, it's a subject we talk today, and we can talk in the Q&A about academic freedom. American universities profess a high degree of academic freedom, and they have it. But this gentleman hauled my teacher, John Fairbank, in front of the House Un-American Activities Committee in the 1950s. Uh, this gentleman here, one of my predecessors as dean, McGeorge Bundy, uh, hauled this then student, this is an older picture of Robert Bella, the sociologist, forcing him or trying to force him to name fellow members of the Communist Party at Harvard in the 1950s. Um, there's, our history is not entirely um, blemish free, let us put it this way. And at the great university, another one of the case studies in this book, UC Berkeley, at the great university there, uh, if there were free speech at an American university, you wouldn't have had a free speech movement uh, in the 1960s. And when one thinks of the politicization that happens to American universities today, it really begins in a big way when the gentleman on the left, Clark Kerr, is fired by the gentleman on the right, Ronald Reagan, as governor uh, because he was deemed to oversee too radical a campus full of protests on the Vietnam War and so on. And Clark Kerr writes in his memoirs, he's the man who built the UC system into the greatest system of public higher education in the world. And he said he went out of his job exactly as he went into it, fired with enthusiasm. Well, in this context here, of course, it's a place addicted to football. The story of Berkeley is the biggest problem story of American higher education, to put it very quickly. Berkeley can't afford this stadium and doesn't have a good football team, but that's a side. You know, they used to be able to afford, if you got a Nobel Prize at Berkeley, you would get a building. Then later on, you would get a lab, and now you get a parking space. Um, uh, but, you know, again, times change. Uh, and the University of California at Berkeley is in the, the, you know, maybe one of the richest countries in the world, but it is one of 44 out of 50 American states that is disinvesting today in public higher education. And as they go down, the private universities such as my own will also go down. A happier story on the American side is this one. Uh, this is James B. Duke, uh, who did more to addict Chinese and Americans to nicotine than any other individual. Here he is smoking one of the 25 cigars he smoked every day. And he donated this beautiful neo-Gothic campus to Duke in the 1930s. But Duke knew it and looked like a great university and was not. And beginning in the 50s, begins to plan assiduously for its rise, and today is one of the best governed, uh, and easily, in academic terms, a uh, combination of research and teaching, uh, ahead of at least half of the so-called Ivy League, at least in my opinion, but also in many of the rankings. And, in, and one of the most self-consciously international, here is its campus in Kunshan, Kunshan Duke, Dashwek, Duke Kunshan University, a liberal arts residential campus uh, outside of Shanghai. And I was senior advisor to Duke in setting this up. So this brings us now to China. And when we think of the rise of Chinese universities, just like the rise of China in the 20th century and 21st century, it's not overnight. It's built on a foundation that pre-exists before 1949. And the history of universities goes back at least to 1893. This is Yen this is what we call Peking University today, but originally the, Yen, the campus of Yenjing University, a Chinese-American uh, enterprise. Uh, Peking University students here on May 4th, 1919, you know, they've been causing trouble for Chinese governments ever since. Uh, but you had this gentleman leading the university at that time, one of the greatest university presidents anywhere in the world. There's a statue of him on the Beida campus, uh, Zai Yuanpei who was an admirer of Humboldt, a believer in Lehrenfreiheit and Lehrfreiheit, abolished professional schools, made the humanities and social sciences the center of education, and brought onto the faculty not only great liberal scholars like Hu Shi, but also China's first Marxists, so that students could learn from multiple perspectives and make up their own mind. And this is a reason why he is revered still today uh, in the Tsai Yuanpei, in the Yuanpei liberal arts program uh, on the Beida campus. This is another university from earlier decades. Uh, it used to be called National Central University, established by Chiang Kai-shek in 1930. Uh, established on the model of the University of Berlin, which is why there's a Brandenburg Gate to welcome you into it. Uh, and then there's Tsinghua University that Professor Bell, among others here, 
know so well, founded as an institution to, in 1911 to send young Chinese to the United States. Um, uh, and this is one of them, Zhang Tingfu, a great historian, uh, chair of the history department, who would go on to a great diplomatic career through the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Uh, but he was also the teacher of my teacher, John Fairbank, at Tsinghua, who learned his Chinese history at Tsinghua University, when Tsinghua University, by the middle of the 1930s, is the greatest research university in China and one of the best small research universities in the areas that it covered in the world. Uh, so there is this strong foundation. Uh, its first campus looks a little bit like the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, uh, because it was the president of that university that convinced President Theodore Roosevelt to remit boxer indemnity funds for this purpose. Uh, and its iconic president, is a gentleman named Meiichi, known to Tsinghua alumni as Tsinghua Da Shui de Yongyuan de Xiaozhang, the eternal president of Tsinghua University. He protected the liberal arts from the Kuomintang uh, censors. He was the moving figure to establish Xinan Lianda, Southwestern uh, United University, when all the leading universities, Nankai, Beida, Tsinghua, moved from the north to the southwest for eight years during the Second World War. And it's his tenure that's associated with these characters known by most faculty at Tsinghua University, uh, dedicated to the political martyrdom of an earlier colleague, that theirs should be du li zhi jing sheng, zi you zhi si xiang. Theirs should be spirits independent and minds unfettered. Uh, well, times change. And in the 1950s and 60s, Tsinghua University looks a little bit less like Urbana-Champaign and a little bit more like Moscow State. Uh, times really get bad in the 1960s, but even then in the Cultural Revolution, some people managed to graduate and some people managed to be right at the center of things. Even then, uh, I don't know how that happened, uh, but we can look in their admissions policy a little bit later if you, if you want. But fast forward to today, you know, this is another project that I uh, was am I actually on the uh, board of trustees of uh, Schwarzman College at Tsinghua University. Uh, and if you think of the ambition of Chinese universities today, so here we have an institution that was founded as a prep school to send young Chinese to the United States. Now it is investing heavily uh, in this Schwarzman Scholars Program, uh, aspirationally to be the Rhodes Scholarship of the 21st century, uh, bringing the best and the brightest from around the world to Tsinghua, not sending people uh, away. And just when you think of this ambition, it really does matter. Um, you know, why, why would you want your son or nephew or daughter or niece, why would you want them to go to Oxford, to the Rhodes Scholarship, to a cold, foggy, sometimes rainy, self-isolating island? off the coast of Europe, when you can go to Beijing, be at the center of things, and have beautiful blue skies, at least some days, like when this was taken. We shall see, but this was the brainchild of the gentleman who is now party secretary of Shanghai, Chen Jining, um, and it's really uh, an impressive ambition, let us put it this way. So as you all know, we've been through a time of massification of Chinese universities, They've grown in quality and in quantity. This is one of the eight universities, the Zhejiang University. Uh, this is Shihuda uh, Ashua in its early plans, Westlake University, a <coughs> kind of an early University of Chicago peer graduate program. Uh, uh, this is Shanghai Tech, a would-be Caltech uh, of uh, China. And another would-be Caltech is not far from here, Nanfang Kujid Ashua, Southern University of Science and Technology. And so if the Americans are disinvesting in higher education, and of course no one is investing more in higher education, you would think that this is almost a, almost a given that at some point Chinese universities, whether in these ranking systems or in reality, will <coughs> overtake their American cousins. This is one of the reasons why different universities like Stanford have centers at Peking and other universities. Uh, you can just see the numbers don't matter so much, but the trajectory of the rise of Chinese universities is unmistakable. In these, in these several international rankings, you can see there are four or five of them here. And here you have uh, Peking University, number 
12, I think, in Tsinghua University, number 14, in the latest QS ranking. Uh, so who wants to take a guess, just uh, randomly, what's number 18 in the world, according to this, these people? It's not in the chart. These are all Chinese universities. There's no right or wrong answer here. What do you think is a great university below these guys? Harvard is above these guys. No, 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 no. <laughs> It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful a small university on the northern shore of Long Island Sound in the, in the state of Connecticut where I was born. I forget the name. Oh, Yale. Yeah, thank you. Okay. <laughs> From a Harvard perspective, this seems just about right. Um, so times are changing. Here, and then aspirations. This is a document signed in 2013 by the, all of the leading American, British, Australian, and many European universities with the C9, the nine leading Chinese universities, on what is a research university. And you can't really read it, but this is a state, set of statements that every president of every major research university could agree with about academic freedom, about unfettered research, about many other things. In 2013, they got it signed just in time for it perhaps not to be implementable. Um, but it's, it does show you what they would wish uh, to do. So when you think of all this, you have this question of how can China not lead this world of universities and the world of ideas? This is one reason. Still at Jada, at uh, Fudan, at many other Chinese universities. I don't know if uh, Jinan, if Shandong, how you have a statue of Mao? No. So you ask any president that still has a statue of Mao, a man who did more to destroy education than any human being in China in the 20th century. Why do you still have this statue of this terrible man? The president will tell you quietly, we missed our chance to take it down in the 1980s. But most of them did. Tsinghua, Beida, they moved fast. This is another reason why one should worry about the future of Chinese universities. These are students who are like me in the 1970s, studying Marx in independent Marxist study groups. Because Xi Jinping said people should study Marx and Marxism. And they went out and read the real Marx. And uh, they went out and started to form labor unions in sweatshops in South China. And it turns out that's not what Marxism is about, according to the Gong Changdang. They were severely punished, and three university presidents or party secretaries were sacked uh, as a result. Are these two individuals courageous scholars at Tsinghua University? The gentleman on the right, Xu Zhangrun, a, an outspoken critic of President Xi, went on Tsinghua University's annual anniversary to present flowers to that plaque about spirits independent and minds unfettered. But they found it under construction <laughs> at that time. So, and then we must think about what about here? What's happening here? I was on the University Grants Committee here for 10 years, uh, an excellent buffer between the government at any point in time and the universities, trying to protect the institutional autonomy uh, and the capacities of individual universities here. We can talk much more about that in Q&A. The last chapter in my book was initially to be the most, how should we say, optimistic chapter about the University of Hong Kong, the one great, the greatest research university in greater China, not under the Chinese Communist Party, but it ends up being one of the most depressing chapters, in my view, in the book. Um, and we shall have to wait and see um, how both those universities and Hong Kong itself recover from the events of recent times. Meanwhile, we have several universities that are quitting university rankings, and I'm going to uh, finish up now in a moment, uh, because they want to pursue a Zhongguo Tesu de Jiao Yu, education with Chinese characteristics. I have no clue what that means, and I can guarantee you neither do they. Uh, but they are. They're both, several of them are not doing so well in the rankings anyway, so why not get out? But, but the idea, you know, put it this way. If I asked, answer the question, can China be the leader of higher education in the 21st century? Absolutely, 100%. It can. It has more of the human capital, more investment, more capacity, uh, and the world of Chinese scholars here and in the diaspora. Uh, but it cannot lead alone. It can only lead in partnership with others. These universities, not these three as much as the other great ones, have grown up in the company of the great universities of Europe and North America. That is the company that they know well. That's the company they want to keep. 
And that is the company that they hope in time uh, to lead. So as we go through these gates uh, from Berlin, here the new gate of National Central University and the new campus of Nanjing University, uh, the gate of Tsinghua, different gates of learning here at Hong Kong University as well. I'll end with this gate here, uh, the Johnston Gate entering into Harvard Yard. The dean of the fact, my office as dean is in that gray building uh, in Back University Hall. It was in, through this gate that this gentleman came in 1936, Hoosier, uh, as the representative at Harvard's 300th anniversary, the representative of Peking University. He was given an honorary degree at Harvard, and he donated, if you're ever near our library, Widener Library, he donated this stele uh, uh, with his own calligraphy inscribed on this stele, a stele, a gift from uh, Chinese alumni of Harvard. Uh, uh, of the Republic of China. And this is what it says. And let's see if I can actually read it. He said, culture is the lifeblood of a nation. It is by virtue of culture that a nation arises. But truly, it is due to learning, to xue in this document, or Wissenschaft, as Humboldt would put it, that a culture flourishes. And intellectuals with deep knowledge and far-sighted vision understand that in uh, setting a solid foundation for their nation, the utmost priority must be given to the enhancement of learning. That was true in 1936, and it is true today in 2023 in all corners of the world. But it's a great challenge to do. So thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I have so many questions, but I'm going to keep it uh, to two for now, and then we'll open it up. Uh, to the audience. Um, first, I just wanted to ask about the role of rankings um, and how great universities are measured. I think, I think in the Times Higher Education ranking when I checked this morning, Tsinghua and Beida were tied at 16, something like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and as you said, other schools are pulling out of rankings now and saying, oh, this, you know, this is a flawed system. How concerned are Chinese universities U.S. universities, German universities, who I think have fallen off the rankings mostly at this point. At this point, how concerned are they with rankings, and what kind of role do they play, basically, in, in how we determine who who the global leader in higher education is? They play a pretty strong, I would say, it, you know, the higher up you are, the less role they play. But if you're climbing, they play a pretty strong role, and if you're further down and want to climb, they play a very insidious role. Um, I was once in giving a talk in Vienna, uh, and the president of the University of Vienna, it's an ancient university founded like 1366 or something like that. Um, they found out that they were now only number 65 in the world, and how is it possible that the rest of the world did not recognize them? Anyway, you get the picture uh, here. Uh, I think, you know, they measure what can be measured. They, they mostly measure, and this is why Chinese universities are rising so fast, they measure publication largely in English language journals uh, in the natural and applied sciences. That is a huge part of what these rankings are. They don't measure, you know, they do faculty student ratio, but that, is, that can be gamed in so many different ways. Uh, they don't measure teaching. They don't measure inspiration. They don't measure mentorship. There are many things that are central to a young person's education that are not part of, of, of these kind uh, of rankings. They do have reputation, but usually it's the academic reputation uh, and not others. I was recently at a leading American research university that is usually ranked in number 10 to 15 in the United States, but they suddenly discovered that they were number 120 in the global rankings. How was this possible? And what were they going to do to change. And they had all these plans to invest huge amounts in STEM and blah, 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 blah. But the fact is, if they did all that and lost the core of their original culture, they will have lost everything. So I think there's a, they, they, they are useful metrics, um, and, but they are, they are not ones to live and die over. But nobody plays this game more strongly than mainland universities today. If you look at the international rankings, University of Tokyo doesn't play, care quite so much. 
So they're further down. Uh, Taida, which is a great university, also does not play this game in the same way. Uh, and so they're further down. But they are great universities, and I think it's probably wrong to assume that you know, Tsinghua, as great as it is, is X number of places better than University of Tokyo. So, so that's, that's it. they're money-making ventures. You know, all of these things are companies. The, the uh, U.S. News and World Report ranking in the United States begins because this news magazine is going out of business and they need a new business to keep going. And that's how the rankings begin in the 1980s. So grain of salt, big grains of salt, salt mines. Um, and then I also wanted to ask you about higher education in the context of U.S.-China relations. Um, there's a huge imbalance right now in terms of there's 300,000 Chinese students in the U.S. and 300 U.S. students in China. Um, you know, there have been U.S. federal prosecutions of Chinese academics, visas revoked, greater scrutiny generally. Right. Um, what are the implications of all this for the future of U.S. higher education and also for Chinese higher education in terms of international partnerships and how students will be affected? Well, you have to begin to rebuild those networks that had sent tens of thousands, but never hundreds of thousands of Americans to China. There are, I think, 352. Maybe it's, somebody got on a plane today, it's 351 uh, uh, American students in, in China, which is a ridiculously small uh, number. But that's zero COVID. That's an aftermath that you, can't, you couldn't come. And, you know, and China, the Chinese government did not make uh, visas that easy to get. And all, anything that would be happening this summer or even next fall had to be planned last autumn when they were still uh, in zero COVID. So there isn't going to be a lag time. Uh, but I think it's incumbent. We are, we've just sent uh, about 30 or 40 undergraduates to Shanghai to work in internships and in companies and NGOs. We are starting a a summer school in Shanghai uh, next summer. We have a new language program in Taipei this summer. So we are, you know, and it's actually the central reason why I'm out here. This, we are there to re-engage. Uh, and <clears throat> we have to hope that we will be met well by our Chinese colleagues. So far, so good. But they're under much greater constraint than they were three years ago. And so we shall, we shall have to see. Um, I was at a meeting, you know, I, I accompanied Harvard's president here in 2019, right before COVID. He gave an amazing speech, uh, Gary Bacco at Beida, on, on the, the centrality of academic freedom and autonomy. And we, meet, we met with uh, President Xi, uh, and we came to this agreement, as it were, actually articulated by Xi Jinping, that universities can do things in an ideal world when governments cannot cooperate. We shall see. Whether he would say that today, I, I, don't, I don't know. But he was very positive about trying to give the message that he wanted to send more Chinese to the US, not fewer. And it was publicly stated in a, in a meeting that was then in the evening news and all that stuff. So he's giving a message to his own government at that time. But if you look at it from the American perspective, you know, a university that today and this includes Chinese universities, that is not open to talent from all over the world. Uh, if we stop bringing in the extraordinary graduate students that we have in our universities from China, India, and elsewhere, American universities will decline without question because admission to PhD programs is the one truly meritocratic aspect of an American higher education. Uh, you know, you don't have to be on the football team uh, or you don't, you know, it's not a, you don't have to be the son and daughter of an alum. Uh, you're actually admitted only by a department on the basis of your academic credentials. And that is one of the things that has made American universities so extraordinary. Biden administration has been very good at giving visas. Trump administration, very bad. Um, I want to get into HKU as well, but I, I have a feeling that will come up anyway. So uh, why don't we open it up to the audience? Um, if, if you want, uh, please identify yourself and your organization, if any. Um, any questions? No questions? It's not a, not a controversial topic, no. <laughs> well, thank you for the lovely 
thank you for the lovely talk. I'm Daniel Bell. I teach at Hong Kong U. Um, I guess a, a few quick questions. One is about Harvard. I mean, why does the decline in funding for public universities, why should that negatively affect Harvard? I mean, if anything, you know, I just on the f my impression is that Harvard should benefit if people would want to go there, given that the other universities are declining. And one is about Schwarzman College. Um, I, so I taught there, it was a, I felt the first year was like a golden year. We had students from, I mean, right. as you know, all the West Point Military Academy and uh, Naval right. Academy. Right. And, and they were really wonderful, really engaging and willing to learn and engage. But apparently that's been cut off, and I heard because of the U.S. government that doesn't allow people from military background to come to China anymore. And more generally, I, there's a worry. This is what I heard, and it may be wrong, that s s very high-performing students from the U.S. are kind of a little bit worried about going to China for a year because if they want to pursue public careers later, they might be tainted as too much exposure to, like, right. to China. I don't know if that's this is just my impression of asking you if, if you have any view on that. Yeah. Um, and then second, if you could talk about Hong Kong U and, and academic freedom. Thank so you. three questions there. Okay. So just on the, you know, um, it is a, a shame that some parts of the U.S. government are emulating the Chinese government of restricting people uh, from going abroad who might have a chance at a political career. Um, and so there's a parochialization of political elite uh, in this country and in, great, in greater China today because if you really do want to advance politically, uh, you're less likely to do so by an international education today because of suspicion and that the Americans in some fields are emulating this is, of course, very bad. Uh, although a lot of our universities, including mine, uh, have, have pushed against it. You know, why, um, you know, let's see, the Schwarzman question was... Uh, about people from military... Oh, yeah, 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 so that's, that's, that's part of that answer. That, that, um, now I'm now I'm blanking on the other two. Oh yeah. So, well, the fact of the matter is, you of course you can get a short-term sugar boost by stealing people from Berkeley or elsewhere, but then that, <coughs> if they no longer continue to hire good people, that will be over. <coughs> number, <coughs> number one, but number two, competition is at the center of excellence for universities, just as it is for any enterprise, any business enterprise. We compete for the same faculty, for the same graduate students, uh, the same senior administrators, not the same undergraduates. Uh, and in a world of lesser competition, the impetus to compete and to do well will be lower. I, I've seen this happen. And so I, I, I think it will be an inevitable decline of all American universities led by the private ones, unless that is stemmed. So, Shanghai Dashu, the reason why it's the most uh, depressing topic uh, for me, I mean, academic freedom, I was just speaking there and, and unencumbered without any saying, saying things that I would say at Harvard or anywhere else. Uh, so, I'm not worried that things have crossed a certain line. Uh, at the same time, the, the intrusion of politics into decision making, who gets hired, who gets promoted, uh, who is not tenured, and so on. Uh, this has been growing since C. Y. Leong was chief executive. And I was the uh, uh, me a th member of a three-member committee appointed by Arthur Lee, then the, count the council chair, who was very close to C. Y., uh, to review the governance of Hong Kong University. And we came up with a variety of extraordinary, mostly simple things of trying to make it. It's a university, because of its age, is encumbered in bureaucracy and you, as you will find out, uh, but has, but, and so we gave some very kind of commonsensical governance reforms, but the biggest one was to get the government out of academic decision making, the, particularly the chief executive. The chief executive of Hong Kong is by statute the chancellor of the University of Hong Kong. Um, and he, um, uh, his predecessors, including the last British governors, this was only a titular position. They, they did not interfere. It was purely honorific position. Uh, but he was the first of the chief executives here to interfere on a regular basis. Uh, and our recommendation, the one that was the most important, uh, was 
that uh, he depute the powers of the chancellor to someone like the provost or the president of HKU so that he could be above politics. Uh, because there are many other ways in which you can interfere with the university if you want to, if you're chief executive. And that's exactly what he told me. He said, I don't need to be chancellor in order to interfere with the University of Hong Kong, uh, but I won't allow this and Beijing won't allow it. And it was a very dispute, you can read about it in the book, a very disputatious meeting uh, that we had. And that report that we gave was then sat on for six months and eviscerated um, yeah, until a new and not necessarily better chief executive came along. Uh, yes, here at the front. Thank you. Um, I'm Dorothy. I'm just curious to get hear more of your thoughts about professional schools and the spread of ideas, like professional schools, because mm -hmm. um, you sort of didn't quite touch upon it. No. And how do they contribute to the spread of ideas or they don't? Um, and the other one is to hear your views on um, naming rights, because it's become quite a big controversial topic in the U.S. I, um, like I forgot the Citadel founder just gave a huge sum to Harvard. Yes. And a lot of people are within, like the students are quite opposed to going to send the name after him. Right. Um, so, again, my mind, the first question, I've got the naming rights in my head. Professional schools. Well, of course they contribute mightily to the reputation of a university today because they are unlike a century ago. These are also largely research institutions. Um, uh, and any business school will have in it people who are sociologists, economists, historians, and so on, who can easily be in different departments of a university. So they're part, uh, part of their reputation, the same is true of law school and, and so on. So they are an important aspect, but they usually when you rank universities comprehensively, they matter, but it's the center of the university in the arts and sciences that is most comprehensively ranked. Um, so Humboldt would be very happy to learn that. Uh, but it is, it, is, it, is the, it is the case. And you have universities in which some of their professional schools are better than their core arts and sciences. Um, and that's, but it's, so, uh, you know, at Harvard, you know, we have a governance structure in which every school is a duli wangwa, an independent kingdom. And so if things don't go well at the center, things are okay in the law school or the business. It's not an ideal form of governance, but it has its aspects in that, um, uh, in that regard. Um, ah, now I've forgotten the first part, the naming rights. Yes, I think, you know, I think the Foreign Correspondence Club should be named by, who, who would you want? Do you have a, by the Jockey Club? The Jockey Club's Foreign Correspondence Club? Sure, yeah. <laughs> Watch out yeah. what you ask for. Um, yeah, it's been happening forever. After all, Harvard is named for a gentleman who donated several hundred books to its library uh, in 1640. Uh, it's the best deal in naming rights ever, I think. Um, and we have now different schools. It is, it is quite different. They have different schools that had never been named before. So uh, a, a great example, though, which I, I think we should be very proud of, both in Hong Kong and here, is our Chan School of Public Health, uh, named by uh, Gerald Chan and Ronnie Chan, both originally from Hong Kong, and Ronnie's still here most of the time. And they're uh, for, named for their father. And this is a school, so think of it this way. Harvard's a very wealthy university on the whole. This is not a wealthy school. The wealth is very unevenly distributed. Uh, in the university, and the Chan School is very tuition dependent, and so, so this is a huge boost for the study of public health. Uh, the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences has just been named for Ken Griffin from Citadel uh, for a figure, I'm, I'm, I'm my own person, assuming that we're all on Chatham House rules, my personal feelings are quite uneven as a graduate of that school, uh, but if it were to be named for him, I would have had a uh, a figure that was considerably larger. Um, but so principles um, can be, <laughs> but I think it's, it's, you know, you know, look at the University of Hong Kong. Is there a building that is not named? Is there a walkway that is not named? Um, it is part of the job of deans of development to try to bring in, uh, it's the one thing is, so 
when you are all donors, just remember this, and you're wealthy, so buildings have a certain lifespan, but they're not forever. Professorships are forever. So endow a professorship or a scholarship or something like that. Leave the buildings to somebody else. So. Uh, other, other questions? I think uh, in, in the corner and then we'll come back here. Hi, <clears throat> uh, this is Herbin. Um, I, I think you mentioned a very interesting statistic about um, 300,000 students from China studying in the US versus only 350 and change. Um, and going back to your book about from Germany to America to China, how does the Chinese government see this statistic, this, the, these numbers, how, in terms of what's the optimal number for them uh, as time progresses? And in terms of, I guess, all these other policies that the government has introduced in the last couple of years, <clears throat> like, um, I guess, uh, I wouldn't say banning tutoring and all that stuff, but obviously changing a lot of things uh, in the education industry. How do these policies help with achieving these goals? And then again, what are the ideal stat statistics that they're looking at from that yeah. perspective? Well, in education, like everything else, it's a mistake to think that there's something called China that has a policy. I've never met China. Uh, but different parts of the Chinese government have different approaches. The Zhao Yubu has been sometimes very supportive and sometimes very restricted. Uh, individual universities have been very anxious to re-engage in this. And one of the bellwethers of this to look at, because of COVID, fewer international students could come to like NYU Shanghai uh, or, uh, or Duke Kunshan. But now they are coming back in, and, and to Schwarzman and to other things. Kind of signature programs remain actually unaffected in principle by this, affected by COVID and zero COVID policy. So you will see, you know, I think, I, think it, I think the jury will be out for another year or so. It will depend in part on the macro political envi environment. You know, do parents feel safe? Do Chinese parents feel safe sending their kid to the University of Chicago? Uh, do American parents feel safe sending their, their students uh, to Beijing? Who knows? Uh, they got, but, you, you can work on this very, very assiduously. And we are our own university, but others are really trying very hard in the coming academic year to send students to China, not, and particularly people who know nothing about China. Uh, we're gonna, and, and actually, which turns out to be a lot of our students, uh, and to send them uh, to China uh, to work and, 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 and travel about and so on, and then to structure programs for what they might want to do uh, after that. We're doing the same for faculty across, you know, most of the faculty who come uh, to China before COVID and now are starting to come again are not in my area of China studies or history or literature. Uh, they're in medicine. Uh, they're in seismology. They're in public health. They're in, they're in the applied and natural sciences. And that is something we will want to continue. We should have a program like that for members of Congress. Oh. I mean, it should be, should be, should be mandatory. But the, I mean, the head of this China committee has never been to China. Why should, you, why should he go to China? Um, you know, you can. But one of the points I want to make, if you look at this slide, is again the intersection of ideas. You know, it's the intellectual and architectural foundations of every Chinese university are international in origin. And it's true, actually, of American universities as well. If you look at that neo-Gothic Duke campus, uh, this is the Beidalo of Nanjing Dajia, of Nanjing University. Uh, and of course, today it has a big red star on the top of it. Uh, but it was built in 1919 by Jinling College, Jinling Dajia, and Jinling Nushi Dajia, Jinling Women's College, which was a sister college of Smith College in Massachusetts, designed in this beautiful architectural style by an American architect who was living in China and an architectural firm. And I just found out from an email the other day from my colleague in our economics department, Dwight Perkins, who has studied the China, that it was his great, great, great uncle uh, who was the head of that firm in New York that designed uh, 
um, uh, Nanjing University's building. So Nanjing University, I have to tell you, is extremely proud to be on the cover of this book, but they actually don't like the chapter uh, as much as they, as they might, so. Um, I want to take one last question we had here. Hi, uh, my name is Darren from Chartwell. Um, during the presentation, we touched briefly on the role of <clears throat> the state versus uh, like private enterprises. And I was wondering if we you know, look back into Germany or America or whatever, like, how, like what is their role uh, in the development of higher education? And is that a good model through which to understand how the industry is being developed in China as well as, I guess, what the implications are as far as things like investment, accessibility, uh, or even the distribution of wealth, right. uh, or the creation of ideas, and, and so forth. Uh, thank you. Well, the state, as you know, in the world of Greater China, it's certainly true here in Hong Kong, the most prestigious universities uh, are government-funded universities, um, and the ones that are leading research universities. But 25% of Chinese undergraduates go to Minban Chui Yuan, uh, private colleges. Uh, some of them poor profit, some of them are non-profit enterprises. Some of them are extraordinary and good teaching institutions. I did a biz Harvard Business School case on Xi'an Weishe Shui Yuan, Xi'an International University. And it's a different model of governance than Tsinghua or Beida because the president of that university, Mr. Huang Tang, doesn't have to worry about his tenure. He owns 55% of Xi'an International University, and a British private equity firm owns the other 45%, and I think his son is going to be his successor. Um, but it has like a 95% placement rate for 35,000 students uh, in Xi'an. So there's a lot going on, and it's one of the virtues of the American higher education system uh, that there are so many excellent private colleges as opposed to research universities that also give different opportunities uh, to individual. So China has much greater diversity institutionally than we normally think of in this regard. But the state itself is central to the funding uh, of the great research universities directly in China or indirectly as in the United States through National Science Foundation uh, and, many, and many others. And then you have local states such as Berkeley and so on where the disinvestment has forced them to be privatized in governance, even though they have public responsibilities, privatized in finance, even though, and that is not a good thing unless you can have a very clear path to it, but it's usually an emergency uh, set of measures. But the last thing I'll say, and this has to do with what's the role of government in making a great research university. One thing that I often say um, uh, in talks about this project is that you know, there, there was this document, in, also in the year 2013, document number nine of the Central Committee the, about Chi Bu seven things not to talk about at a university, things like human rights or civil society or constitutional government or early history of the PRC, and so on. So, so seven very clear things. And I always say, in an ideal world, a great university has to be a place where there isn't one thing one question that can't be asked, let alone seven. And almost always when I'm giving this in the, in the United States, somebody will raise their hand and they'll say, well, that's not true at Berkeley, is it? Or that's not true at Harvard. There are at least seven things you can't say at Harvard. Uh, they're not wrong because there are different forms of censorship. You have censorship from on high uh, in China and you have censorship peer group and others in the United States that has become really quite worrisome, although I think it's beginning to abate. But you have uh, universities have to be places in which unpleasant ideas can be heard, unpopular ideas can be heard, and places where people can't be shouted out or kept from speaking, whether in China or the United States or anywhere else. That's the aspiration of a great university. Well, Professor Kirby, thank you very much for being thank here today. You. Thank you. Is, is the book available in Hong Kong bookstores? Uh, it should be if you order it, but I looked for it as the big one in Pacific Place and I couldn't find it. Um, huh? Bookazine? Okay. Kelly Walsh, okay. 
and it's available by Amazon and so on. And the, the postal sensors don't have to read it yet in Hong Kong. So, um, yeah. And I've been sending it to friends in China without any difficulty. Maybe because of the cover gives it some insulation. I, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, but yes, it should be. So feel free to, you know, for, for, uh, buy many for your friends and family. <laughs> yeah, great question. So um, um, a Chinese version uh, is being done in Taiwan. Uh, but I also would like a simplified version done. And that is more likely to be done through a local university press here in Hong Kong than through Beijing. Because I just think it would be too painful for my friends at Beida or Tsinghua to you know, have to apologize to me as to why this chapter has to go. Um, and uh, you know, there are, I mean, actually most of it should be perfectly fine, but there are some important points that one would want to have in it. So, so fingers crossed that the simplified version comes, comes out of Hong Kong. Um, thank you all again very much. Thank you again. Thank you all for coming. Hope to see you again soon.